Its walls were chiseled from the limestone bluffs of the Missouri River. And, in fact, the Missouri State Penitentiary has always been called The Walls. A maximum security prison, it was built with no plan or pretense to reform anyone. The walls were built to make bad men pay the price for their crimes severely. Well, you know, Patrick, one of the things that makes this prison so unique, it's a virtual timeline as far as correctional history. And what people always think of Alcatraz, but ac actually this prison had been in operation for a hundred years when Alcatraz opened. And uh, by 1935, this was the biggest prison in the United States with uh, over 5,000 inmates. This is the oldest penitentiary west of the Mississippi? The oldest prison west of the Mississippi River opened in February of 1836 and at that time the Battle of the Alamo was going on and Andrew Jackson was President of the United States. Mark Schreiber has spent much of his 35-year career behind these walls as a corrections officer. He recently co-authored Somewhere in Time, a history of the penitentiary and of the men who spent years here with little more to do than wait for their lives to pass. The prison is empty now. The inmates have been moved to a new facility and this large portion of downtown Jefferson City will be developed, though much of the penitentiary will be preserved. So Mark, housing unit number four is about as close as you could ever come to what people think of as an old prison building. That's absolutely correct. When you think of 19th century corrections in the United States, this is an example, a perfect example of early corrections in this country. How old is this building? This building right here, Housing Unit 4, which originally was called A Hall, was actually built in 1868, right after the Civil War. And you said the prisoners themselves actually built this? The prisons themsel prisoners themselves actually built this building. They quarried the stone right here on site. You can see the marks in the stone, some of the elongated marks over there, where they actually drilled it out by hand using star drills, using block and tackle. They quarried the stone. They built this building. And prisoners actually lived here until when? Prisoners actually lived in this unit until when we moved out September the 15th, 2004. Can we go inside? Sure we can. Let's go. After you. I sort of expect to see George Raft or <laughs> Jimmy Cagney maybe. Yeah, James Cagney. It's, uh, you've had some celebrities here, haven't you? Oh, yes. Yeah, we've had a lot of celebrities here. This. This cell right here probably is one of the uh, more famous people that was here most recently. Cell number 33, Sonny Liston, was in this cell. What was he in here for? Armed robbery. Came here in 1950 from St. Louis. He actually got his fame started in this prison. He really learned to box here, and the staff really liked Sonny Liston. So this is Sonny Liston's cell? This is Sonny Liston's cell. It's not very big. No, but it's big compared to some of the others. The sad part is, is at the time that Sonny Liston would have been here, there were up to five or six men that were crammed, all African Americans, crammed into each one of these cells. In this little room? In this little room. The harsh conditions provoked a riot in September of 1954, when 2,500 inmates broke out of their cells, attacking guards and each other, setting buildings on fire, and turning Jefferson City into an armed camp. Four inmates were killed, but there were no escapes. There have always been problems with escapes or escape attempts, almost since day one. They've been documented. Uh, the 1920s, there was probably the highest number. In recent times, there have been a lot fewer escapes or even escape attempts, but you always have to be concerned about it in a maximum security prison. Uh, I guess probably the most famous escape in recent times was uh, in 1967 when James Earl Ray escaped from this prison, uh, and he hid in a bread box. What's the best way out of here? Mm, if I were going to try to escape, I'd want to do it an easy and safe way. And that easy and safe way would be to be in civilian clothes, uh, to have a false ID, and to try to go out doing shift change. Mark, I've heard that at one time prisons and jails were actually tourist attractions that people would come in and gawk. Oh yeah, that's correct. Uh, they, even had, uh, they even had a staff position here and uh, I have a picture of that in the history book where they actually had a person and that was basically that person's job. 
they would uh, charge like 25 cents and people would come in and they would take them through the institution on a tour and they could basically walk wherever they wanted to walk and that wasn't uncommon not only in this prison but in other prisons across the country. When was that? That was in the 1920s and early 1930s. That late? Yes. The area out here is the industrial area of the prison. Uh, the green and white building down there is Old I Hall, which was the supermax of its day. Pretty Boy Floyd did some time in there, a short stretch uh, in, the, in the 1920s. Supermax, super maximum. Super maximum security, absolutely. And uh, the roof is even concrete down there, and that was in the days when they tried to break people out with dynamite. This is the gas chamber right here, and it was constructed with inmate labor about 1937. There have been a total of 40 executions in this particular building, 39 by lethal gas and one with lethal injection, which was George Tiny Mercer in 1989. This would be the cell where the condemned would spend the night beforehand? Well, sometimes the night beforehand, but usually they were brought down here at this institution just a few hours before the actual execution took place. Waiting probably in vain for a call from the governor's office on this phone. And there would have been someone here on the line directly to the governor's office and it would have been open so the communication could have taken place. The governor probably didn't call very often. Not very often. What you see here, of course, is the gas chamber, which was built on site. The door behind me was from a World War I submarine. You have two chairs. There were a total of four double executions, including the first two that took place in 1938, the holes in the chair are where the cyanide gas uh, arose from the container underneath once the pellets were dropped into the solution and caused the cyanide gas. The red lever right here is the lever that would have been used to uh, actually drop the cyanide pellets uh, into the container under the chair. And the lever up above, the gray lever, is the lever that would be used to uh, vent the cyanide gas through the vent on top of the chamber once the execution was complete. Time passes slowly here. For 168 years, the days passed into night and rolled into years, decades, and lifetimes while the face of the walls never changed. No one dreamed that a day would come when the doors would be open, the cells empty, the yards quiet. Even the briefest visit here will change the way you think of time and freedom. For those who spent their lives here, as employees or prisoners, the walls have meanings a visitor will never understand. I'm thrilled that we've got a new state-of-the-art, much safer, much nicer, much more efficient institution, but uh, part of me is still here. And a big part of my life was spent in and around this institution, as uh, were a lot of other people's lives. So I, I have mixed emotions about it. but. Uh, but uh, time marches on and we have to as well, so I'll leave it at that.